أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين Alhamdulillah, we recapped extensively yesterday, so we don't have to extensively recap anymore. But we will suffice with a shorter recap of the matlab that we have covered so far. We start this journey out by saying that the wudda, the wudda, the love, the deep aspiration and deep love of Abu Abdullah that we have in our hearts that has brought us to this particular tent. Where is it sourced from? The ayah told us that this love is actually sourced in the faith and the good deeds, the amal salih of Abu Abdullah. We said, look at how great the cause must be, because look at how great the effect is. After 1400 years, we are still coming to the tent of Abu Abdullah. And this effect will last, inshallah, till qiyamah. So we said, we have to make sure we have a real tree. This particular tree of belief that we have within us, the root of which is imama, it has to yield its fruit in the 24 hours. So you got to make sure it's a real one. Otherwise, if it's an imaginary one, it will not yield in those fruits. Next, we went to study what would harm this particular tree, what will cause issues in this tree. So we went to see some termites. Termites want to see waswas. How waswas now affects man? We said waswas was non divine whispers. And these affected man where? At the level of the action, at the level of the relationships, and at the level of the root belief system. Okay. We talked about the heart of man having two ears. And we said, the analogy of the landing strip. This should be opening up a lot of meeting now because we reviewed yesterday and the day before that. We continued from there. After talking about the landing strip, we continued from there. We said, how does Waswas now, these termites, affect the root belief system? We said, we have three root belief systems. They were what? They were the origin Tawheed, the destination Ma'ad, and the in-between, Divine Walaya. And we said they're a system. They're not three root beliefs independent of one another. They're a system. Because they're a system, what was the purpose of this in-between, this Divine Walaya? It was to take man from where he is to the right destination. And the right destination was the return to the origin. The return towards Tawheed. We saw how Waswas affects this particular root belief system. It separates them, and then once they're separated, it becomes easier to deform them. And in deforming these root belief systems, man starts to have an imbalance in his actions. We gave a few examples. We gave the example regarding the people who we encounter when we visit Mecca and Medina for Ziyara. We showed how they transgress and they have an imbalance. We also gave many examples of our own as well. Then the discussion continued. Yesterday we used two big words extrinsic and intrinsic we saw that having an instruction manual really is not enough so having an extrinsic understanding of your deen is simply not enough okay we said what we really need is an intrinsic understanding having the instruction manual only gave you the presence of the mind. It only conceptually made it clear for you the positions of your deen. 
So the instruction manual was simply not enough. So we say we need to now make the actual bookshelf itself. The instruction manual is not enough. The actual bookshelf is what we need to put these books of meanings in their place. So we have to take now the presence of the mind and go towards the presence of the heart. What do we say? We said that we're not looking for a submission in our mind. We're not looking for a mental submission towards our Rabb. We're looking for an actual one. So this actual one has to be a submission within our 24 hours. This is now going towards building that particular bookshelf. What happens when you do that? Well, now reading simple words, words because they're sourced in the origin, it isn't like reading a newspaper anymore. Because you're out to unpack them and get words. We saw the example of the Habib of Hussein. How one very simple line from Abu Abdullah made him calm and peaceful. He went beyond the appearance of the word and towards the actual meaning of it. I start to realize that how important it is to have a heart which is clean from the filth of sin. So as I'm trying to fix my relationship with Allah, as I'm trying to bring balance to my relationship with others, my family, my body parts, my 24 hours, as I'm bringing balance to these relationships, as I'm taking the termites out, I experience its direct impact on the amount of access I have to these meanings hidden in the words from the wilaya itself. Why? Because this wilaya is sourced in the origin. It's sourced in Tawheed. So now, when the verses of the Quran are recited, I interact with the meaning itself. And hence, I'm now making that bookshelf. My iman increases. Wa iza tuliyat alayhim ayato zadat hum imana. Salawat, please. Today, we want to see the relationship between the Imam now and the Sharia. What is the relationship between the Imam and the Sharia? And say, okay, is this relationship an arbitrary one? Is it a fake one? Or is it a real one? Before we go in answering that, we have to know what arbitrary relationships and real relationships are. We'll start off with an example. Imagine you have a very unfit gym teacher. Okay? If you have a very unfit gym teacher, this particular person is pushing you towards what? Saying, listen, you have to work out. You have to eat healthy and so on and so forth. He's not in line with the guidance that he's giving. He doesn't embody the guidance that he's giving. And the guidance does not represent him either. Neither is he an actual representation of the guidance nor is, the, nor is the guidance an actual representation of him. There is no unity between the two. Therefore, it's an arbitrary relationship. It's a relationship which has been formed. It's conceptual in nature. It's not realistic. It doesn't have a link in existence between that which is being taught, and the teacher itself. The Holy Quran gives a warning here. Let's look at what the Holy Quran has to say. When you have arbitrary relationships happening, let's look at what the Holy Quran has to say. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala isn't scared. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
He is not politically correct. He is not scared to say certain things just to make people pleased. So he says it exactly as how it should be said. Okay? He doesn't leave anybody out of the picture. If you're the son of the Holy Prophet, you're the wife of the Holy Prophet, you're the children of the Holy, Holy Prophet, the Anbiya, I have something to tell you as well. You're not out of the equation. The Holy Quran does not leave them aside either. Look at what the Holy Quran is saying. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Walakad arsalna Nuhan wa Ibrahim. Waja'alna fi zurriyatihima nubuwa wal kitab. We sent Nuh and we sent Ibrahim. Okay. And we placed in their zurriya. What do we place in the zurriya? Nubuwa and we placed the kitab too. Who are the zurriya of Nabi Ibrahim at the time when this verse was being revealed? Let's, let's re recap a little bit. The Quraysh were. Okay. At that particular time, the people who were claiming that we are linked to Nabi Ibrahim. We are the representatives. We are the leaders because he is our ancestor. He is the one that gives us sharaf. Okay? These people were claimants of a relationship with the Nabi. The Quran continues and says, فَمِنْهُمْ muhtadin." From this zurriya now, from these people who were in the zurriya, some who be, whom one quality of the Zuriya was mentioned already, which was what? That we gave the Zuriya Nubuwa and Kitab. So there were certain individuals in the Zuriya, they were pristine. We gave them both Nubuwa and we gave them Kitab as well. Certain individuals in the Zuriya were pristine. Like the, like the likes of who? Like the likes of Nabi Musa, Nabi Isa, the Prophet of Islam. But that's not all that there is to the Zuriya. The Quran continues, says, فَمِنْهُمْ muhtadin." So some of the grandkids of these prophets, well, they found Hidayah. Okay? They took their apparent link to the Prophet and they embodied it. They made it actual. Okay? The Holy Quran continues. وَكَثِيرٌ مِّنْهُمْ فَاسِقُونَ Allah is not scared to say it exactly how it is. He said, كَثِير Many Many of the descendants of the Nabi that we sent they were transgressors. They were infected with termites. What was the effect of waswas? Waswas, when it affected man, it pushed man to transgress. Fisq is the Arabic translation of transgression. To go beyond the bounds. If we've said to someone that the brothers are going to sit here and they go beyond the bounds, They've transgressed. They've gone beyond the bound. Allah SWT is saying that those people who did not find guidance, they did not follow the Nabi, they transgressed. Which group was this from? This was from the Zurriya of the Nabi. Do we have the Zurriya of a Nabi present today? Yes, we do. Those who are claimants of the title Sayyid are the Zurriya of the Nabi. The Quran does not leave anybody alone. There's guidance for each. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say about the Zurriya of Nabi Ibrahim? Because the Sayyids in definition are the Zurriya of Nabi Ibrahim through the Holy Prophet.
It says, those of them who found guidance, فَمِنْهُمْ muhtadin. Though some of them found guidance. But what does it say about the kathir? وَكَثِيرٌ مِّنْهُمْ فَاسِقُونَ if I'm somebody who's from the Zurriya of the Nabi, the Quran is addressing me. Saying, be very, be cautious. Just because you have an apparent relationship and an apparent claim to a relationship with the Nabi, that's not sufficient. That is absolutely not sufficient. Just like how having the presence of the mind and apparent understanding of the deen was not sufficient. It had to be an actual one. Here too, an apparent and a lower relationship with the Nabi, the physical relationship with the Nabi is not sufficient. It has to be an actual relationship. The Quran continues. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not done yet. Now that he's addressed those people who have the relationship with the Nabi, the Divine Wali, at the lower level. Remember, whenever I'm using the word Nabi here, I mean Divine Wilaya, which is synonymous right now for us, for Imama as well. We'll see how in tomorrow's lecture, inshallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not done. What does he say? He doesn't just want to guide the Sayyids now. In today's world, he wants to guide the rest of the people too. So the next portion goes and talks about those people who have another claim. What type of claim do these people have? They have a claim towards a spiritual relationship. This is now a higher level of a relationship than the physical. Who are these people? Let's list them out. Let's call them out. The top of the list are the scholars. If you are if you are a scholar, if you are a student of the religion of Islam, in fact you're claiming a spiritual link to the Nabi. Who are the next people? Who are the next people who follow the Nabi in guiding others towards Tawheed? Well, it is the community leaders. It's your TMAs. It's your Islamic youth group admins. Your volunteers. It's your EC at Husseiniyas. It's anybody who's trying to provide an environment for spiritual growth. If you find yourself in that position, that you're trying to provide an environment for spiritual growth, whose job are you doing? Whose job was it to lead man to the right destination? It was the job of the Imam, the Divine Wali. You are now in trying to do the job of the Imam, following him in it. It was his job. So you're claiming a spiritual link now with the Imam. The Quran has a warning for you too. Remember, is it bad to claim this link? No. Does this link need to happen? Do we need to help the Aima? Of course. Is it bad to be a Sayyid? No, it's a blessing. We have in a riwayah looking at the face of Sadat is an Ibadah. But people typically stop here. The riwayah although continues. As long as they haven't committed a sin. Okay. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the next verse is trying to now address in a very specific and special manner those people who do ittaba, those people who are now following the Nabi. Who else is following the Nabi? Who else wants to provide a place for spiritual growth? 
If you are a Muslim parent, you're part of the picture. Because you're trying to provide an atmosphere at home for the spiritual development of your kids as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this next verse, the warnings that are present there, He's addressing you too. The verse continues. The next verse starts off like this. ثُمَّ قَفَّيْنَ عَلَىٰ آثَارِهِمْ بِرُسُلِنَا قَافِيَةً قَفَّيْنَ قَافِيَةً It's, you know, in poetry you have these stances and these verses that follow one another. They help one another in both form and they help one another in meaning as well. So Allah is saying, ثُمَّ قَفَّيْنَ عَلَىٰ آثَارِهِمْ بِرُسُلِنَا We sent Nuh and we sent Ibrahim. Then, in appearance and in meaning, we sent other rusuls after them. وَقَفَّيْنَا بِإِيسَ بْنَ Maryam. And again, we sent Isa ibn Maryam. He had a special trait. He was also in form, in appearance, and in actuality, in both ways. He was similar to the Nabis before him. He was not only conceptually conveying the deen, he was realistically living it too. Okay? Now look. وَآتَيْنَاهُ Injil. We gave Isa Injil. وَجَعَلْنَا فِي قُلُوبِ الَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُهُ رَعْفَةً وَرَحْمَةً وَجَعَلْنَا فِي قُلُوبِ So we, what did we do? We did جَعَل we, we created, we put in the hearts of those who did اتَّبَعُ Who followed the Nabi now Who followed Nabi Isa in this particular verse We gave them what? We gave them رَعْفَة And we gave them رَحْمَة why? Because they were claimants of following the Nabi. They were doing taba'ah. They were following. Okay. They were following both the teachings of the Nabi and they're following the Nabi in the sense that they were also taking others towards the destination the Nabi was taking them. It taba'ah has two meanings to it. One is, according to some dictionaries, to make others follow someone else. Ittaba'a. In other translations, you'll see just says those who followed the Nabi. We haven't lost any customers yet. Both, both meanings aid and assist to our meaning that we're trying to teach. Whether you follow the Nabi or you make others follow the Nabi, in fact, when it comes to providing us a position, a place for others to develop, it's the same thing. Because one of the things the Nabi did that you follow him in is guiding people to the right destination. Just like you follow him in the Sharia, you follow him in this, his rules and his laws, you also are following him in this aspect too. Which is what? To guide others towards Allah. So the list we said, they're all part of the puzzle. Then Allah mentions something that these people who were Apparent claimants of followership of the Nabi, Nabi Isa, Allah makes a claim about them. Says what? وَرَحْبَانِيَّةٌ وَرَحْبَانِيَّةً إِبْتَدَأُوهَا مَا كَتَبْنَاهَا عَلَيْهِمْ إِلَّا بْتِغَاءَ رِضْوَانِ اللَّهِ He said they started to do rahbaniya. They started to do rahbaniya. What's Rahbaniya? They started to distance themselves from society and live on their own, away from people, away from things. They don't need a family, they don't need kids. They started to, they elected for themselves, they appointed for themselves this trait called Rahbaniya. وَمَا رَأَوْهَا حَقَّ رِعَايَتِهَا Even though they appointed it for themselves, they still did not do the ri'ayat, the haqq of that. Okay? These people, what happened? How does this particular practice link to the scholars, the exec, the administration, the TMA, the parents? Okay? 
we ourselves placed ourselves in the position of the Anbiya. We ourselves said that we want to now guide others to them. We want to be a source of guidance too. This is a great thing. Allah is saying He's helping us with Rahma and Ra'fa. But He says, if you don't do Ri'ayat of this particular thing, if you don't do riayat of that particular thing, what happens? If the scholars don't practice what they preach, if the TMA, the EC, the administration don't strive in the spiritual growth the same way they're asking others to strive, if the parents don't leave their bad habits while they're asking their kids to leave bad habits, what happens? Well, those who do practice what they preach, they get their rewards. Those who are good scholars and who practice what they preach, we give them their ajr. Those who are part of TMAs and youth groups and ECs from the Husseinia and actively try to practice what they're pulling people towards, they themselves embody the guidance themselves, we give them their ajr. But what about those who don't do that? What about those who transgress? Who don't do riaya, who don't follow that which they preach. وَكَثِيرٌ مِّنْهُمْ فَاسِقُونَ Many a people who are claimants of this ittaba, many of the people who claimants that they're trying to follow the Anbiya, they're trying to get others to follow the Anbiya, many of them, وَكَثِيرُهُمْ وَكَثِيرٌ مِّنْهُمْ فَاسِقُونَ they transgress. These termites are everywhere. At every level that I, as a scholar, preach something but don't practice it, I'm transgressing my position. At every level, me, as an EC, as a volunteer, as a TMA person, as a youth group, Every position and every time that I preach something, I hold an event, but I don't embody that meaning behind that event, I'm transgressing. I have to be careful. Does it mean don't hold these events? No. Does it mean don't preach? No. Bring balance. Get rid of the termites. Salawat, please. So that was the fake type of relationship, the arbitrary relationship, where there really is no real link between the claimant and the claim. There is no real link, there is no existential link between the claimant and the claim. What about the Imam and the guidance that he performs? Remember that gym teacher who was unfit? Well, this time we have a gym teacher who is fit. Okay? A gym teacher who's fit and he's what? What is he prescribing? He's prescribing to be healthy. But it's possible this guy, while being fit, he may smoke. So partially goes against that which he teaches. Not fully, partially. He may eat unhealthy sometimes. Again, partially goes against that which he's preaching. This is a secondary level. Third level. He might crave junk food. He might crave something that goes against his beliefs that he's trying to preach. This is another level of distancing between him and that which he's preaching. If you have any one of these three levels...
if you have any one of these three levels, whether you are extremely deterrent towards your thing that you are preaching towards, the guidance that you are trying to give, whether you're at a lower level going against it, or whether you aren't going against it in practice, but inside you, you crave something other than what that which you're preaching. And the relationship between you and that which you're preaching is not a real one. It's an arbitrary one. What's the relationship between the Imam and the Sharia now? Let's look at that. There is no discrepancy between the two. The Imam embodies the Sharia. There is a unity between him and the rules that he brings. If you were to take the Imam and you were to take the Sharia, there is nothing in the Imam which is contra to the Sharia. There is nothing in the Imam that goes against the Sharia. And in the Sharia, there is nothing but the appearance of the Imam. Such that if you take one away from the other, you've taken a thing away from itself, really. Such a thing is impossible in nature. Such a thing is existentially impossible. Okay? How does this link happen? See, sometimes when we think about the Imam, we limit them to their physical appearances because we're used to that. When I think of my brother, I limit him to the physical appearance that he has. For most humans, that's true. That's all there is, is a physical appearance. There's the nafs and the aql at the higher level too, but that's about it. Most humans are limited in their capacities. But this divine wali was what? He was sourced in the origin. He was sourced in Tawheed. If Allah is the provider of existence, then the Imam is the doorway by which that existence is given. The Imam is much more deeper in existence than what we perceive him to be. There's a unity between him and the Sharia. Let's look at how the Ahl Bayt themselves describe this. There's a surah we read every single day five times at least, ten times at least. Surah Hamd. In that, there is this idea of Sirat al Mustaqim. Okay. The straight path. Going towards what? The right destination. Which is what? The return to the origin. Does that sound familiar? Oh, it does. We have a hadiths. There's going to seem to be an apparent contradiction in these hadiths, and we'll solve the contradiction. Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, Imam Baqir alayhi salam, both have this hadith. Salawat, please. You see, Sirat al Mustaqim. Deen Allah. Alladhi nazzala Jibra'il ala Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. 
They say what? Sirat al-Mustaqeen is the deen of Allah. Which deen? Maybe they're trying to use symbolism here. No, this is the deen which Jibra'il brought down towards the Holy Prophet. That's one set of ahadiths. We have another hadith from Imam Sajjad now. He says what? Nahnu sirat al mustaqim. He said, We are the sirat al mustaqim. Okay. We have a third hadith now, too. This is from Imam Sadiq as well. We're going to try to collect these three. Someone asked him, what is Sirat al-Mustaqim, Imam? He says, At-Tariq wal-Ma'rifat al-Imam. Sirat al-Mustaqim is the pathway and the Ma'rifa of the Imam. What is the Sharia really? The Sharia is the Ma'rifa of the Wali. His characteristics. Who's the wali? The wali is the embodiment of these rules, this deen. This unity is not arbitrary. This is existential in nature. If you were to take the sharia and you were to ask it, if we separate the imam from you, what is left? You would say that's an impossibility. You can't separate the Imam from me because the Imam is an embodiment of the Sharia. If you were to take the Imam and say, Imam, if I was to take you and take the Sharia away from you, is there something left? No. The Imam is the embodiment of the Sharia and the Sharia is the embodiment of the Imam. There's a unity here. And now he's the Imam in the Sharia. Imam meaning what? The one who's leading. He's leading at what level? At every capacity now. He is the entire embodiment of that which he's preaching. He does not transgress. He is not affected by the termites at any level, even in the thoughts, even conceptually. Nahnu sirat al mustaqim, as Imam Sajjad says. In the sessions that are about to come, inshallah, we will look at certain aspects of the Imam that should push our understanding of them beyond the apparent. They're not bound by the physical body. An Imam is not limited to the two eyes and two hands and two feet. He was an Imam before humans. He was an Imam before Nabi Adam existed. That means what? He was not bound by this material world. This particular concept oft repeated, the philosophical understanding that goes behind that is that the Imam existed at a realm of meaning. The realm of meaning has no form. It goes beyond form. A quick example of that, if you were to tell me what is the form associated with love? There's no form. Yes, love can take on a form. You could have the love of a mother. You could imagine your mother and that could create the meaning of love. But love itself transcends form. It exists in a realm at a level that's beyond the form. So at the highest realm of existence, you have the existence that does not have form to it.
because a form by necessity is a deficiency it's a limitation at the next realm you have the realm which encompasses form but not matter so the image of an apple right? this re remains at a level that maintains the form but not the matter and the lowest realm that we have is the, is the realm further limited that essence of existence that existed you limit it and you give it a form now it's a lower level of existence then you limit it more and you constrict it to matter now it's the lowest level of existence the material world okay the imam transcends the material world let's look at histor a historic example of how even the young kids in the house of Aba Abdullah understood Aba Abdullah to be. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un Tonight's historic example is of Abdullah ibn Hassan. What a young man he is. See, when you see young kids and they want to go to speak to a group of strangers, they get scared, they get shy. What a young man he is. Look at the amazing virtue he has. Look at the traits of this young man who overcomes his young age. On the battle of Karbala, the people who were in the field, who were against the Imam and attacking him, they were ruthless wolves. This child shows no fear before them. When he sees the deen of Allah surrounded by animals, there's no fear in him. There's no shyness in him. He does what has to be done. The grip was tight when Abu Abdullah is now solid. Sayyida Zainab is going up and she's holding the hand of this young child. She's gripping his hand hard because she doesn't want him to go towards the battlefield. As they're climbing up the Tilla Zainabiya, she's holding this child with her and she's coming up. This child is speaking now. The grip was tight. My aunt held me so. When we reached atop the cliff, she fell to the ground. So I broke free. When they reach on top of the cliff, they see that the Imam has fallen. Sayyidah Zainab cannot take this scenario. She cannot take this scene. The deen of Allah is surrounded by these wolves. Abdullah sees that the deen of Allah is surrounded. He sees these hungry wolves. Those who had swords were using their swords. Those who had spears were using their spears. Those who had arrows were using their arrows. Those who had nothing to hold back. They had nothing in their hand. They were throwing rocks. 
Abdullah sees this. He knows he's very young. But the audacity of these so-called Muslims is too great. He runs. Look to the courage of this man. Ya Hussain, when they threw, I too flew, Mawla, the rocks to you, and I ensued, Mawla. The rocks to hurt, and I to protect Mola. Now Abdullah raises the Godal, he reaches the Godal, he sees the Abdullah there, he's reached him. And he sees this man and he says to Abu Abdullah, he raised his sword. Now Malun is there, he's trying to strike his master. Abdullah is recounting this for us now. He's still telling us this. He raised his sword. So I raised all I had. Mola. He had nothing but two hands to raise to protect his Mola. He raised his sword. So I raised all I had. Mola. Him to kill and I to protect Mola. The sword came down and it cut me too. But I saved you, Mola. I saved you. Please have a seat. Sallallahu alayka ya Abu Abdullah. Sallallahu alaykum. Ya Ahla Bayt. Now the hour has come, Abu Abdullah is looking to his right, he's looking to his left. He's calling out, Ya Muslim ibn Aqeel, Ya Ali ibn Urwa. He's calling out, Ya Habib, Ya Zuhair. Why won't you answer me? Now Abu Abdullah is on his own, surrounded by the enemy. The men have left the tents, only the children are left. But when the wali of Allah is in danger, responsibility knows no age. Abdullah is restless. He wants to make his way towards his uncle Abu Abdullah. Abdullah knows his father Imam al-Hasan is not here today. He knows his brother Brother Qasim has already gone. Abdullah says, I want my share as well. Zainab. Zainab sees Abdullah wants to run and she grabs him. He says, don't hold on to me. Zainab sets me free. Uncle has fallen on arrows, don't you see? 
He makes his way out of the grip of Zainab. He rushes towards the enemy. He says, وَيْلَكَ يَبْنَ الْخَبِيثَ أَتَقْتُلُ عَمِّي Woe on you, O son of a wretched parent. Do you want to strike my uncle while I am so watching? Abdullah is six. Don't forget his age. And if you've seen a six-year-old, you know how small a six-year-old is. That Mal'oon Bahr ibn Kaab raises his sword. When he raises his sword, he raises it to strike a grown man of Abdullah. In this moment, Abdullah throws out his arms towards his uncle. Don't you dare strike my uncle while I'm still here to defend him. I am the inheritor of Imam al-Mujtaba. When that man Oon brought his sword down, he brought his sword down upon the hands of Abdullah, such that his hands were hanging from his skin. Now he calls out, I've read this report, he calls out something that any six-year-old would call when he's in pain. He said, Ya Allah, he said, Mother, I don't know, Abdullah, were you calling your mother or were you calling the mother of Hussein? Perhaps it would have been more appropriate to call out to Fatima to Zahra. When the man won't strike your hands, maybe you are too young, but your uncle remembers. In the alley, when the man won't strike the hand of your mother, Zahra. How I wish your grief ended here, Hussein. Moments ago, a young Abdullah Rabi, a six month old, was in your arms. Now, a six year old Abdullah is in your lap. The Mal'oon, the Mal'oon took his spear. Won't you leave him alone? <laughs> Yeah, so, so, so.